Welcome, everyone. Good to have you with us. We're enjoying what today will be our last episode in the book. Out of the books that I've covered, it's probably been the one I've most looked forward to, and it has not disappointed. I don't know if I'd say it's been my favorite necessarily, um, but there's been just time and again, I've just been really, really challenged by this book. You know, this is a book that I thought I knew decently well before we got into it, but you go through it slowly and carefully, and I, I've been changed by it, and I've been encouraged by it, and I hope you have too. If you've been encouraged by this content, we give this freely. Um, we don't we don't charge for this. We're not going to make a subscription where you can get behind a paywall and, and have to do that. We, we give this freely, and so if you appreciate this content, one great way you can, you can show your appreciation uh, is to share our content on social, um, share it with a friend, just or just follow us on social, whether that's um, Facebook, Instagram for 15 minutes and a big idea, or uh, follow the Minute Collective on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. All of those things are great ways to show you appreciate what we're doing, um, and, and we, we appreciate each and every one of you and your support. Today we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, verse 21 to 23, which will be our final text. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21 to 23. Three. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. We're into the final text of Philippians, and we've done it once again. If my math is right in production, you know, I'm recording these a little bit ahead. Um, this episode will drop the day after our four year anniversary. Um, we started this in, in 2020. Uh, and that means the day this drops will be the start of year five of 15 Minutes and a Big Idea. So if you've been with us from the beginning, thank you. And if you're just joining us, thank you. If you caught us somewhere in the middle, thank you. We're just glad each and every one of you are here. Um, one thing I will mention, uh, maybe this goes in the, in the in the earlier opening remarks, but um, thinking we're thinking carefully about what book to go to next. And so we'll have several Q&R episodes, so we'll have a few weeks on deciding that. Um, hit that down in the comments below where you think you'd like to go. What book should we study? Um, we're, we're really excited for that, um, and uh, by the time this drops, we should have recorded our question and response episode, so look forward to that next week uh, and in coming weeks. For today, I'll say we've got a seemingly unimportant text. It's one you may not look at very closely, but it's actually going to emphasize a lot of this, the themes we've seen throughout this entire book, um, and shockingly, we may not go full 15 minutes. I, don't, I just don't want to... I want to let the words speak for themselves rather than pulling it off in all kinds of different directions and... I know I've got it in the title of the podcast, but we're 200 episodes in, so we can break the rules every, you know, 100 episodes or so. So with that, um, Paul's going to bring together a lot of things we've already seen, including the theme of this letter, which is that Christ is sufficient, no matter the circumstances. Christ will abundantly supply your needs. Christ is enough. Today's big idea is experience Christ in his people. Experience Christ in his people. To understand that supporting idea, we'll look at number one, the letters for the saints. Number two, the team is essential. And number three, the grace of Christ will supply. This letter's for the saints. The team is essential, and the grace of Christ will supply. Saints, team, and supply. The first idea comes out of the first phrase in which Paul commends this greeting of all the saints. This practice of greeting is more than just a hello when you run into people. It's not just a social protocol that you have to uphold, but rather it's the act of embracing each other as brothers and sisters. It's not just a communication of a social pleasantry, but it's, it's being joined together and accepting one another. If you want to mine these closing benedictions from eating, uh, it's nice to check them against the greetings here. Recall in the, in the opening, Paul wrote this letter to the saints. Remember that? He wrote this to the saints. But he also addressed it to the elders and deacons here. And in this case, there's no mention of church officers, as he wants to see the people that are greeted. There's no special word given to them. The greeting and the acceptance of people should extend to every saint, not just the important ones. While Paul has been concerned with the members Yodia, Syntyche, Clements, Epaphroditus, along with the, the, the elders and the deacons, here at the end he greets everybody. In that sense, all saints are important and affirm. They are the holy ones of God, and they should be treated as such. Importantly, that means every saint is worthy of service. That means every saint is worthy to be employed in the service of the king. Every saint is worthy of us serving them, and they are worthy to be used in the service of the kingdom of God. We must consider ourselves the servants of every Christian, of every saint, as Paul did. 
and we should seek to work together and share in the advancement of the gospel. Paul had this attitude towards everyone in the church at Philippi, and we need to have it towards every member of our congregation, because as our big idea says, we know Christ through his people. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at this next idea. Paul commends that his co-workers with him at the time, they also greet all the saints which are in Philippi, and he goes on to say even those of Caesar's household. So those who are in Caesar's household, the gospel had even reached to that degree to where they were greeting these people as well. Perhaps that even means they knew of the Philippians, a little, you know, small town in Macedonia. The people who are around Paul in Caesar's household know about this church to greet them. And often when we speak of the uh, the author of this book, we use Paul as a shorthand, but notice here, those who are with me, and if we go back to the very beginning, it includes Timothy as a co-author, and that's that's the case in, in actually most of his letters. In over half of Paul's letter, we have an explicit co-author in the introduction, and for those we don't, towards the end, we see that he's with some people in some way. And in this case, I believe we see Paul, enabled by the Holy Spirit, using the wisdom that we've observed a moment ago in that there is power in a team. There is power in a team. He uses these various other resources as he address others. This model of cooperation is integral to Paul's ministry. You know, sometimes we think of Paul as this solo guy going around, maybe he had a dude or two with him, but Paul was a team player, and he wanted other people involved. This is integral to his mission and his vision for life in the kingdom of God, of people working together, and he showed that in spades. Beyond the writing, Paul is noting that he had people with him in his imprisonment. And that model of cooperation is so central to Paul and what he's doing, and its effect can't be overstated. Paul shows it again and again and again that mutual participation of the gospel is for the glory of God. And as he's called them to true fellowship, to strive together, to have those attitudes, to share with one another, we, we see and we learn that we need to believe this wholeheartedly. Because part of the way we experience Christ is through other people, that we have that team, and together we make up for our, our own insufficiencies, and together we have each other's backs, and that sense of cooperation allows us to experience the grace of Christ. In some way, there's an experience of divineness in the people of God, that one of the ways God reveals himself to us is through his people, and so we can't keep ourselves disconnected from that. Even the Apostle Paul, a man who had been to see God in heaven, a man who had seen Jesus on the road to Damascus, a man who had a deep intimate connection with God, he knew that you need other people as well. And so we likewise need to realize that teamwork is essential. Even for an apostle of Christ, teamwork was an essential thing. And so we need to have a spirit to incorporate others and see the wisdom of God and the blessing of God that comes from it. Lastly, Paul convinced them to the grace of Christ. Notice in the opening, once again, we read that Paul writes grace to them. And in this case, he writes grace be with them. I'd assert that, that Paul sees this letter as a means of grace and, and blessing for the Philippians. Upon having read, studied, and internalized this letter, they will have and possess a more full understanding of the gracious giving of God. They will have experienced that, that God would give them a gift in some way by this letter. This letter, inspired by God... <laughs> is going to be a mechanism or a conduit whereby God is going to supply them something. Further, this should emphasize the things we've seen throughout the entirety of this letter. Now, there's a myriad of things that, that Paul could have wished for for them. He could have wished for peace, for patience, for love, for sanctification, for hope, for righteousness, or another myriad of blessings, and some of which he definitely indicates. However, the grace of Christ is sufficient. And as we saw last week, Paul has complete trust that God will supply their needs in Christ Jesus. The Philippians need to learn to lean into that and to embrace the good nature and generosity of Jesus Christ. They need to see the reality and joy of contentment in Christ. To not see it in pushing further by their, their physical distinctions, but to see knowing Christ as the ultimate prize. Every need they truly have, physical or spiritual, is going to be richly supplied. And so, if the grace of Christ is with them, they will never lack. As we mentioned, this brings us to the end of the episode, and, and it's a little shorter. But I want to, to stay and look at the heart of this book, of what we have. And I want to quickly review in broad strokes some of the themes that really tie to this ending here. As you've seen, the notion throughout is the sufficiency of Christ. In chapter 1, we read that living is Christ. In chapter 2, we read about the blessing of the mind of Christ and being an example of Christ. In chapter 3, we saw the pursuit of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. In chapter 4, we learned that our strength 
comes from Christ. He is our strength in all things. Moreover, Paul and his co-workers are a continual demonstration of that sufficiency. This becomes an invitation for the Philippians to join and two for us to join. They can see the power of Paul's joy and his trust so that Paul becomes an example of Christ to them. This example becomes a compelling display of what it looks like to trust in Christ. Moreover, it beautifully shows the mind and heart of peace that comes from having our hearts set on Christ. From beginning to end, Christ is the thing. Christ is the target. Christ is the goal, and his upward calling is where the greatest joy and sufficiency is found through fellowship with him and with his people. If we get that in line, everything else is going to fall into place. And we see that in Paul's character, that even though he was in prison with hardly nothing and great suffering and longing to just go and die, because he had this in mind, he was able to trust those blessings and find sufficiency in the most difficult circumstances. Is Jesus enough for you? If you were stripped of every worldly possession and comfort, would you cling to Christ? Begin to think about the blessings you have and ask which one do you hold the dearest? Which one, if it were stripped away from you, would tank your life? How can you meditate in your mind and give that need to Christ? To look ahead, to see and recognize that if you lost this thing, your faith in Christ would be shaken, and to begin to press more fully into his graciousness. How can you meditate in your mind to give it to him? How can you focus on his blessings so that this or any comfort, its loss, you can you can maintain contentment in. Can people see you as an example of Christ? Are you pursuing the fellowship of Christ and of his body? Are you pursuing the mind of Christ and his humility? Are you pursuing the upward call of Christ and his resurrection? Are you pursuing the peace of Christ and his contentment? Is Jesus and knowing him the most important thing to you? Thank you so much for joining us today on 15 Minutes in a Big Idea. Today's big idea, experience Christ in his people.